All right. So, uh, so this is the first of, of a three-part series on different theological issues relating to coronavirus. Three different uh, topics, different responses to uh, coronavirus in terms of, of Jewish thought. It will inter intersect with uh, with halacha, with more practical issues. But really, the focus here is on is on the values, is on the more theological side of things. And uh, the first topic, and maybe uh, probably the most important topic uh, of all relating to to uh, Judaism and coronavirus, is the question of of uh, whether you know whether one should shut down, whether and when one should shut down or reopen various institutions, and especially. Uh, especially the religious institutions, the shuls, the uh, the Jewish schools, etc. So there, there's uh, you know just at the outset, there's obviously a clash here between the value of preserving human life, and we're going to look into that in, in uh, great detail. The value of preserving human life and all sorts of other values, including the value of, of davening, of tefillah, the, da the the value of Torah study, the value of of being able to function normally and in, in a in a regular uh, a regular uh, context, a regular lifestyle. And we're going to see there's, there's going to be a few different attitudes, a few different approaches as to how to balance these different issues. Um, so this is very much uh, a relevant issue right now, as, you know, if you look around, certainly the U.S., there are some shuls that have reopened, some shuls that are soon going to reopen, or at least are considering that possibility. Uh, in Israel, already many, many uh, institutions, most of the country has been reopened. Um, but uh, with restrictions. And so it, on the one hand, it's a very relevant issue right now, but it also was, was uh, the, the first issue really to come up um, almost three months ago, or one of the first issues um, in, in, uh, in early to mid-March when a bunch of institutions decided to, uh, you know, decided to close at, at one point or another. So it's, uh, it, it's, it, you know, it's an issue that's come up multiple times and uh, you hope it doesn't continue to come up. You hope that uh, that, um, you know, all the, the health uh, challenges go away, but there's a, a decent chance that this issue will continue to rear its head for this foreseeable future. So let's, let's jump in, um, jump in, and I'm sharing the uh, screen now. So we have the, the handout. Let's jump into this topic and, and try to discern what, what, the, uh, what the different perspectives are on how to balance, uh, how to balance uh, the, you know, the value of human life and protecting human life and, and shutting down and avoiding one another in order to not spread coronavirus on the one hand, and the other hand, uh, the the uh, all the you know all the usual values of of uh, tefillah, of, of Torah study, of living a normal life, and how this plays plays itself out. So as was mentioned, this issue has come up. It came up you know back in March, and uh, as I'd say March 12th was when institutions really started shutting down. Uh, I actually push for that uh, in an article, but I think the real, the, the tide really turned um, when the RCBC, uh, the, the Rabbinical Council of Bergen County, uh, shut down all the shuls there, and uh, within a couple of days, many other institutions shut down, and within a couple of weeks, almost everyone shut down, and, uh, you know, it was, it was a, a prescient move at the time. This is before, uh, certainly the RCBC acted before the government recommended closing down institutions or, or not going to work. And those extra few days, and especially that extra Shabbos after Purim, when shul was closed, prevented um, a much greater spread of the disease. So on the one hand, this issue came up in March, and it's coming up, it's coming up now again, where uh, number one, that throughout the last couple of months, there have been some institutions, both in America and Israel, that have sort of been open, remained open, uh, undercover, as it were. And certainly now, uh, U.S. Orthodox rabbis split over resuming communal fear, communal prayer amid virus fear. This is the issue that's facing every shul right now. Is it, does it make sense to reopen now? With what restrictions? How to do that? So we're gonna we're gonna jump into this uh, this issue, which has attended the past three months uh, and a, a most crucial and significant issue. So before before we get into the details, it's good to just get the basic principles, which is the the weight accorded pikuach nefesh or, or saving a life the value that Judaism uh, prescribes to human life. And uh, source number two here is the Gemara and Yoma. It gives a whole litany of possible sources of minayin the bikuach nefesh, shedoche es shabbos How do we know that saving a life violates, you can violate Shabbos, so to speak, you can break the usual rules 
of Shabbos in order to save a life. There's a whole bunch of sources. And um, Shmuel, uh, the Amor Shmuel says, he, he suggests um, the following source, V'chai bahem v'lo The Torah says, um, this, this is the Torah, this is the, the, the laws that are given, asher ya'aseo sam ha'adam v'chai that a person should do and live by them. And the, and the person should live by them, not die by them. Meaning, the goal of the Torah is to preserve life, is to is to enhance our lives, is to be a an, an, a life ennobled by service of God, not a, a religion of death. And that's a very central value. It's a very short derivation here by Shmuel. And uh, Rava says, you know, all the other sources you you can quibble with, but bar me the Shmuel pircha. You can't argue with Shmuel. And this is the authoritative source for why Judaism. Uh, sees human life as overriding just about every commandment in the Torah. I say just about. There's there's a few exceptions. Um, I didn't uh, quote the source here. It's not directly relevant to our topic, but there are uh, three mitzvos or categories of mitzvos that uh, take precedence and where one should even give up one's life. The Val Yavor. That is, uh, if one's asked to kill someone or to violate various uh, uh, sexually prohibited acts. Um, or to uh, commit an act of idolatry uh, or related acts. Those, those three categories, one should uh, be willing to die rather than violate. Um, none of those are relevant here. And there's a, a couple of other categories of if uh, someone's intentionally trying to get you to violate Judaism as like a litmus test to show that you, you know, to show that you don't actually care about it or something, especially in the time of Shmad, where there's a government decree against, against keeping it and there's a, a, a Chil Hashem aspect, there's some sort of public desecration uh, of, of God or of, of Torah by violating it. That may be an additional exception. None of these seem to be applicable here. Right here, the issue is, assuming there is a real danger to someone's life, which we're going to get into, you know, how you determine that, assuming that there's a real danger, um, that should override all Torah, all, all the Torah uh, precepts. So, you know, whatever, however exactly you define the value of going to shul and davening together as a group and uh, being able to, to uh, uh, to learn Torah together in school, etc., whatever the value of those precepts, those would be overridden, in, in theory, by pikuach nefesh, by the uh, value of saving a life. Just to give uh, a sense of how severe, uh, how, how strongly Judaism views pikuach nefesh. So the Gemara and Chulin here, we're not going to go into the details, but it talks about how uh, someone leaves, uh, leaves open a, uh, a plate and, and there's an issue, two possible things that may have happened to it. It may have become uh, ritually impure, um, or alternatively, it may, there may have, been, uh, may have been poisoned by, uh, by a snake, sort of a snake's backwash or whatever it is. And at the end of the day, the Gemara decides that if, in terms of the Tumma issue, that depends. If you, if you know for a fact that, uh, or you have a, you know, you, you know it's more likely that it became impure, then it's impure. If not, if you're not sure, then it remains pure. Um, Suffolk, uh, uh, right. So in a case of Suffolk, in a case of doubt, it remains pure. We don't say that it's originally impure. However, if it's suffig mayim megulim, if it's a doubt as to whether this water uh, was left left uh, unattended and possibly poisoned uh, by a snake, we say that's usher, that's prohibited. And in a, in a case of doubt relating to danger, we are stringent. So shma mina chamira sakanta meisura shma mina. That's the key line. We see from this distinction that danger is treated more stringently than prohibitions. In whether something is permitted or prohibited, that we can be lenient in a case of doubt in, in some cases. Whereas whether, um, whether something's dangerous or not, if in, when in doubt, uh, play it safe and, uh, and don't enter danger, we take that very seriously. In fact, we even say that a fake spake, a doubt of a doubt or a remote doubt is sufficient to invoke pikuach nefesh, to, to, to invoke uh, danger to one's life and uh, you know, do whatever is necessary, including violate usual Torah precepts in order to, to preserve the life. A couple of other sources uh, in the Shulchan Aruch, Shin Kav Ches, which talks about Pikuach uh, Nefesh talks about these halachos, these laws. So we say, If someone is sick and really in danger, mitzvah it's, it's a positive precept, it's a commandment to violate Shabbos to save them. The faster you do it, the better. It's praiseworthy. Let's say you're not sure, you want to ask a question, you want to ask the doctor, you want to, as soon as you start asking questions, if you know that there's a, a reasonable chance that someone's in danger and you start asking questions, is a shofech damim. You're you're a murderer because you're taking a risk with someone's life by asking the question. You shouldn't do that. So that again shows the the severity of this of this mitzvah. And, uh, a few halachos later, um, what if the doctors disagree? Fine, 
uh, external diseases, you also violate Shabbos. Vim rofe echad omer, tzarich. The rofe echad omer, eno tzarich. You have a dispute among doctors. Do you need to perform this operation right now? Right? Is the person really is the person really sick or not? Or they maybe they're not sick at all. Maybe they don't need an operation. If there's a dispute, mechal, and you do whatever is necessary to uh, to save their life, even if it involves violating Shabbos. Some say you don't even need to ask a doctor, even if you have a, a non-specialist who thinks that there's a danger that's sufficient. And the principle here, suffik nefashas lahakel, we're lenient. Uh, in terms of a, a, a risk to one's life, meaning we're lenient with Shabbos when the value on the other side is potential risk to life. So, um, so yes, yeah, so that's that's the, the those are a couple of halachos showing how severely, how stringently we treat this topic, and and we take human life very very seriously in Judaism. So let's jump now a bit more to the practical side of things. So I think um, if you go back to March seventeenth right after the flurry of institutions that closed themselves. So it's sort of interesting to see the, a, time, a timeline of it, which I, I guess I, I tracked uh, back then, which is the, um, you know, there were early adopters of Pikuach Nefesh. There were the institutions that closed relatively early, um, you know, uh, from March 11th through March 13th, really the day, a couple days after Purim, before there was wide-scale government and medical recommendations to do so, various uh, shuls, the RC, uh, rabbis like the RCBC and the other and the RCA and OU a couple days later, you know, took the jump and said, we should all shut down. Then a few days after that, um, there were later adopters and more or less on, on this, you know, at the same time as the government. When the government said to shut down, they also said to shut down and they, you know, they invoked Bikuach Nefesh. They said, there's a danger here, but that took them a few more days uh, and arguably, you know, uh, added significant danger. And then we're going to see this in some detail. There were some that, you know, even at that later date, said that they were closing not because of actual danger, but they uh, they said we're forced by the government to close down. That's why we're closing down. Um, and that's really three different groups um, back back in March. And I think we actually see these are really three different attitudes, three different overall perspectives on how to apply pikuach nefesh nowadays, right? Uh, in the, in the current situation as well. So, um, you know, uh, we're, we're going to look into these sources in great detail, but again, just to give an overall scheme, an overall framework, I think there are three different attitudes here, which, which correlate to what we saw uh, in March, which is one attitude is that we should be less concerned with, uh, with these dangers than the rest of the population. Meaning, if, uh, you know, if the, if, if the general standard approach of when to open is, you know, is uh, to wait a bit, we should be more, we should see the urgency of uh, Torah study or davening with the minion and, and to, to reopen our institutions sooner than the general population. That's one, uh, that's one approach. Another approach is to be equally concerned to say that, you know, whenever the government opens up equivalent of a shul, the equivalent of a religious school, namely a school, we should open up at the same time. We should more or less treat, uh, treat it the same as what the government at large does. And then a third attitude that we should be more, more concerned about these dangers than the rest of the population. And even though everything else is opening up now, the equivalent of a shul is opening up now, we say, no, the shul should remain closed because we still think there's at least some danger. So those are the three attitudes writ large, but we're gonna now spend uh, the next uh, bunch of minutes examining in detail different manifestations of these, of these positions. So first, the attitude that's uh, less concerned about danger than the, than the general population, than the population at large. So there's a few different manifestations of this. Um, I'd say probably one, one that, that, that becomes fairly clear on a rhetorical level in terms of like the messaging is if an institution says we're shutting down, not because pikuach nefesh, not because it's dangerous, but because the government made us. We're forced to shut down. Otherwise we wouldn't, otherwise we'd stay open, but the government's forcing us to close, so, so we close. So someone who has that approach is pretty, making it pretty clear that they're less concerned with the dangers of remaining open than the government is, or than the regular, the rest of the population is, right? Because they're 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 uh, uh, appealing to necessity rather than appealing to pikuach nefesh. So uh, back in March 16th, uh, you know, less than a week after Purim, when when institutions were starting to close, so based Medrash Hagadol, the the large yeshiva in Lakewood, sent the following letter to their students. I'm sorry, the quality of the picture isn't great, but in any event, I translated it. And um, the, the Hebrew is not equivalent to the English. So we're going to, so uh, I, I put the other translation of the Hebrew. 
and this is a letter from the Russia yeshiva to the yeshiva. And they say, given the pandemic, it's a plague in the city, and then may God save us as a merit of the, that, that the merit of Torah is a shield. We're hopeful that uh, with our prayer we'll merit salvation, so general tefillah. And then they say, to our great distress, we are forced to comply with an express governmental decree that pr uh, prohibits us to leave open Bate Midrash in which the voice of Torah reverberates. And due to our absolute obedience to decrees the government opposes upon us, uh, we're going we're gonna to have to follow them. We're calling out with a request that even though the Bate Midrash will not be open, everyone should strengthen themselves further in Torah and prayer. Um, everyone's obligated in Torah and, and in learning Torah and in calling out to their creator, and we should merit a full salvation. But the, the key point here is, they say to their great distress, they're very upset about this, and uh, that they're forced to comply with the governmental decree. Right? They're not going to wage uh, a rebellion. That's not, uh, not wise. But the reason for closing is not the danger, is not pikuach nefesh. That's not invoked here. The reason for closing is because the government is forcing is forcing that upon them. Now, um, you know, you can, you can say this is, um, this is a, a good while ago. This is uh, uh, several months ago. And maybe if you asked these uh, Rashi Yeshiva, they would say that they might see it differently now, um, given, given, that, uh, given that things have changed. But, right, but this is, this is uh, uh, the 20th of Adar, uh, less than a week after Purim. And uh, they're saying, you know, when, when other institutions had closed, explicitly saying it was Pikuach Nefesh, and they did not invoke Pikuach Nefesh. They said, we don't, we're closing because the government made us. So that's one case where you see that uh, the messaging certainly is that this is not a Pikuach Nefesh situation. There's, the reason to close is because of coercion, is because of uh, one's forced by the government. Uh, an even more extreme uh, uh, scenario is uh, represented by this uh, letter of Pashkaville, the letters they put up in, in Israel, um, uh, in Meish Arm and other places. So um, a few a few rabbis, uh, Moshe Zev Zarger, who is a Satmar rabbi in, in Yerushalayim, published the following letter, Das Torah, right? They're expressing their Torah view. Um, and uh, we're not going to read the whole thing, but it writes, um, We should never do this, what everyone else is doing, to close their institutions. We shouldn't cancel anything. All, all Torah activities, all shuls, all bate medrash, all mikvahs, and when they say mikvahs, they mean men's mikvahs uh, as well, should remain open. We shouldn't cancel any religious activities. And what about the danger? So the, one of the responses um, that uh, th this group and other groups have invoked is that when there's danger, the best way to protect against danger is not by running away and hiding and stopping religious activity, but precisely by increasing religious activity. As one person said, you know, we need our tefillos now more than ever. How can you close the shul? So um, this, this played itself out in uh, largely, maybe most prominently with Rav Chaim Kanievsky, uh, recognized as the Gadol Ador, the great uh, Torah scholar and, and decisor of the current generation in the Haredi world. And um, originally, there's a sort of a back and forth. Originally, people came to Rav Chaim Kanievsky and said, what should we do? And he said, keep all the institutions open. For what reason? Torah magna umatza. Torah protects and defends. And as long as the yeshivos, as long as the, everyone's learning Torah and davening, that should protect us. Now, one of the arguments that's been made against that is um, in, in, a, in a situation where it's, uh, there's a lot of danger that, that uh, those sources are not applicable. We're not going to go into details about that, but there was a little bit of an internal debate about that. A few days later, um, there was increased pressure on Rav Chaim Kanievsky, and he then, uh, and, and like maybe also clarification of the reality is always a question um, how, many, you know, how many details is someone like Rav Kanievsky getting? And then he made the decision to close down the institutions when they said that it was, it was very dangerous. Then a few weeks later, there was, a, or, or sometime later, there was a whole discussion again of whether to, to reopen or not um, well before the government did it. So there's a, a back and forth on, on this front and there was even tension uh, reported between Rav Kanievsky and Rav Gershon Edelstein, sort of the other major leader in the Haredi world. There was a big, a big debate on this topic. Um, and in the end, in the end, that you know, they did shut down, but later than everyone else, and they opened up or pushed to open up earlier. And the the argument here, and this is a related line, Rabbi Kanievsky says, canceling Torah study is more dangerous than Corona. Right? If you think that Torah is what protects you, then um, then uh, shutting down Torah institutions is the most dangerous thing. So again, it's hard it's hard to know for sure what exactly the basis is here. Is the is the understanding that the danger is not such a great danger, and that's why 
um, one can resort to these arguments. Is there somehow an argument that despite the usual rules of what's the Harik Val Yavor and what's not, what one what needs to give up one's life for and not, that this, um, that uh, coronavirus somehow, uh, or that, that Torah study is somehow an exception, that does, there don't seem to be sources that really say that. Um, so it's, it's hard to fully understand this view as a reasoned view, as opposed to a view based on, on uh, insufficient information at the time. If we go, if we move more recently, a couple of weeks ago, as let's say in New York, the, uh, the wave of, of uh, coronavirus had, had decreased, things were less dangerous. So we have Pinchas Frankel, um, who formerly was a rabbi in Flatbush. Um, so he told his whole shul, he says, okay, it's less dangerous. Everyone has an obligation now to dive into Tefillah B'Tzibur. Maybe you do it outside, you figure out a way to make it safe. Um, he himself wanted to open his own shul and uh, make a long story short, there was a lot of pushback from the shul and he, uh, he resigned his position and gave, gave uh, a whole speech where he criticized those in the Haredi world who said to remain closed and to, and to delay reopening until it was safe, including he, uh, one of the institutions he critiqued was the Moetzes, the rabbinic leadership of Agudas Yisrael. He said that, you know, there was this letter that the Agudas signed, but the, the leading rabbis never saw it. And the, the idea of waiting and, and making sure that things are safe before reopening, um, that was never agreed upon by the Gedolim. So a couple of days after he said that, um, you know, a week and a half ago, the Moetzes themselves, the rabbinic leadership, um, signed the following letter. And this is sort of the three senior statesmen of the American Haredi world, Rishmul Kamenetsky, Rav David Feinstein, Rav Aaron Feldman. They wrote the following letter in both Hebrew uh, and English that the, the response to the slander and they, uh, on the topic of how and when to reopen shuls and Batei Medrash. And they said that the um, they want to want to do it, want to do it in accordance with the law and to make sure there's no further danger. And they said that the standards that they put out, we're going to see in a minute, were fully accepted by them and with the approval of the Moetzes. And uh, the idea that the Aguda acted without the Moetzes are complete fabrications. So, there, but the, the relevant point for us is that there have been some voices, um, uh, some voices in uh, in parts of the Haredi world that have argued. Uh, in this case, including. Uh, including R Rabbi Pinchas Frankel, um, uh, that have argued that really we, things should reach open, things should reopen now, and there shouldn't be this continued wait. Things are safe enough even before the government gave the okay. And uh, then, you know, a couple days after that, actually, the the uh, both Governor Cuomo in New York and uh, and uh, President Trump for the U.S. both pushed for reopening religious institutions. And at least part of the backstory, it's hard to know the full backstory, but according to Matzav, Satmer, the Satmer, one of the Satmer Ravs actually lobbied the president to reopen uh, houses of worship, including shul. Let me give the, the story here. But for our purposes, what's, what's clear is if you, uh, if you are trying to get the government to open up sooner than it wants to, or at least to allow shuls, shuls to open up sooner than it would advise, presumably you are less concerned about the dangers than the rest of the world. So this is one view that I think you can really put together these, these different approaches, um, but they're all the same basic worldview to um, either not close down at all or to only close down uh, under great pressure, under, under coercion, or to lobby the government to allow reopening. In all of these cases, it's, it's clear that there's less worry about Pikuach Nefesh than the rest of the population. And again, if it's absolutely, one presumably can't say that there's no, no worry about dangers, but um, so, you know, potential arguments are Torah protects and it's, therefore it's not really dangerous, something like that, or that the, and this we're gonna see much more in a second, that the rate of danger is low enough that this is not something that we worry about. One, one of the things that, one of the arguments that's been made is, you know, in the past, there have been plagues of various sorts and they never shut down the religious institutions. So we don't believe in doing that. The risks are low enough. It's not like, it's not like everyone's dying. It's a, it's a small percentage you know, whatever the numbers are, uh, people, a percentage of people gets a case die, maybe that's low enough that that doesn't really count as pikuach nefesh. What's the standard? What degree of danger is enough to qualify as pikuach nefesh? So I think attitude number two, this new, next approach we're going to see, which is to be equally concerned with the rest of the population, to not say, uh, you know, despite some of the fairly strong sources we saw before about, you know, fake, fake, even if it's a doubt of a doubt, it's a minimal risk, you still have to, uh, you still uh, take the danger seriously. 
But okay, but you know, that only goes to a point. There's a certain point at which it's no longer concerned, considered a danger and one can be lenient. And this approach largely leans on an idea uh, called a Shomer Pesayim Hashem, following the verse in Tehillim and in Psalms. And um, um, we'll see, Rav Moshe Feinstein has a tshuva about smoking, where he talks about this. Um, actually, Rav Moshe's own position on smoking may be more complicated and... Uh, you know, he may have been more anti-smoking than this tshuva allows for, but let's just take a look at this on its own. So, Bidvar Ishun Sigarios, Tavshin Kaf Dalit. So that was 56 years ago, before, you know, when people had some idea of the dangers, but not fully. Um, not as much as we have now, certainly. He named Bidvar Ishun Sigarios, Vadai, Mikevan Shiyesh Chashash, Lehischalos Mize, Minaroi Lizar Mize. Certainly, since there's a risk of getting sick, you should, it's proper to avoid smoking cigarettes. To say it's prohibited based on the danger, since it's a case that many have already done, right? A lot of people smoke. In a bunch of different Gemaras, there's this concept of Shomer Psalm Hashem. If something is done that is dangerous, but is commonly done, then, uh, then you know, it can't really be prohibited. There must be some permission for it. Shomer Psalm Hashem, literally meaning God protects the foolish. So even though this action is dangerous and foolish, but we can't say it's prohibited because uh, because it's so common that it must be that that uh, God protects those who do this, and there's sort of a, an exception. And he adds, "With many Torah greats in the past and today, today uh, you know uh, in the, in the '60s smoke." And then since it's not prohibited to smoke, although it's pre- one should not smoke, but it's not prohibited. Therefore, there's no problem of giving someone a cigarette or, a, uh, or you know, giving someone a light. But the idea, the relevant idea here for us is this idea of Shomer Pesayim Hashem, that there's some leeway, and there's a little bit of a question of how to apply this. But um, usually, something that, some combination of the two factors uh, are, are applicable. One, as Rav Moshe pointed out, something that many people do, Dashu Baravim, it's, it's commonly done, number one. And number two, something that people aren't worried about, that people don't experience as risky. So, you know, you could talk about smoking, but to give a, a different example, what about driving, driving cars, dri- certainly driving on a highway, um, there's a significant, you know, a calculable chance at least, it may not be a super high number, but it's a number of risk that one might die for, for ride, every time one rides on the highway. And yet that's permitted. We don't prohibit that. So there has to be some cutoff. We don't say it's a, it's a suffix of a suffix of secret, right? It's, it's not on the map, it's not considered dangerous. There's a permission um, to drive on the highway, certainly if one's driving safely and following the relevant uh, traffic laws. So why is that? So presumably that's based on Shomer Psayim Hashem, that at some point it's common enough and it's not experienced as dangerous. Uh, that It's just sort of off the map. It's not seen as dangerous. So the, the question is, how would one apply that? How would one apply that now? So you might say that one should be equally concerned uh, as the rest of the population. If the rest of the population says, um, you know, to open, to open institutions on date X. So you say shul should open on the same date, the, sh- the equivalent, whatever it is, whatever, if a shul is like a, 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 sh- a restaurant, then whenever restaurants open, shul should open. You should be equally concerned. Why? Because this, this makes a lot of sense. At once all the instant, once all the, the uh, let's say all the restaurants or all the, all meetings are happening. So that becomes dashu barabim, that becomes something that everyone does. And then, uh, and then one would invoke Shomer Psalim Hashem. That's considered the scenario that, that God protects those who are even taking these, these risks because, you know, it's a normal thing now. It's not, it's not a significant risk anymore. And uh, so, you know, presumably the, the view that there aren't as many clear formulations of, but I think many people hold this view that one should be equally concerned as the rest of the population rests on this idea that uh, if everyone's doing it, it's not considered it's not considered dangerous or not considered dangerous enough in the eyes of halacha that one would be prohibited from doing it. Just to get a sense of some people saying this, this is from like the uh, coffee room, sort of the chat room in the, the Yeshiva World website, but uh, and also something you, you know, one hears a lot uh, in an offhand context, how can the shuls be closed while the restaurants are open? And, uh, you know, back and forth about this, but, uh, you know, also our Torah and Tfilos are what keep the world up and running. Um, so, you know, the Gedoli Torah say not to shut down the schools, although I think since then that's changed. But you hear this on and off, both as institutions were closing down, people said, why are we closing the shuls if the government hasn't imposed the lockdown yet? And now as, as places are starting to open up, people are saying, well, how, of course, once, 
you know, once a restaurant would open or once, um, you know, other, other activities, uh, social activities, once the beaches are opening, then certainly we should open shuls as well. And of course, one can make distinctions on a medical level, you know, what's the danger of, of spread at a beach or a restaurant versus shul, but, you know, you, you can control for that. But w the point is the idea of comparing shul to other things and saying shul should have the same standard uh, that, or, or, you know, a, a Torah observant Jew should have the same standard as any other American citizen seems to be assuming this idea that if it's normal, it must be per permitted. If you look at the Agudas Yisrael reopening principles um, that actually we, we mentioned before, that was the partially targeted um, by some on the right. But if you look at the principles, um, they, they write about various different things. They say, number one, or number two, actually, on their list, uh, that, that, you know, number one, everyone's desperate to, you know, have a normalcy and have Torah and tefillah. No activity may begin until local government and rabbinic authorities deem this activity safe. So one requirement is government, uh, is government uh, allowing it. And also the rabbis need to agree. And then they say there need to be specific protocols and that an abrupt return may be counterproductive. Um, and they say that the, the national guidelines are a floor of safety protocols. So, um, uh, but, and they, they have various other limitations. But what they don't add, and, and uh, we'll see in a minute, the RCA does add is this idea of sort of building in an additional wait period. I mean, there are some ways that they're trying to be a bit more stringent, a bit more careful, but there's the, the basic assumption is once the government opens up, as long as the, uh, opens up uh, various activities, once the, uh, you know, the rabbis can, can see a reasonable uh, structure that, that keeps things safe, there's reason to open up. But, we, but uh, you know, as we'll see, other groups, the, the RCA uh, has suggested that one should automatically wait. Whatever, whenever the rest of the world opens up, there should be a wait period of a couple of weeks beyond that. That the Agudah does not say. So they're, you know, maybe a, maybe a drop more stringent than the, the norm, but more or less are on board with, um, with the, the norm, what, with what everyone, uh, with what opening up other institutions. Now, um, one of the challenges of, of taking this approach is, well, if there's a couple of issues. One is, you know, one could argue just sort of, uh, you know, theologically, halachically, philosophically, one could say that there's greater reason to be careful. And we'll see some who say that. There also is a more practical worry, which is that, um, you know, it's not, as was mentioned, it's not so easy to, to see, to compare a shul to other institutions. Maybe a shul is different in various ways. People are close to one another. Um, you know, there's a, a, a really a warmth and a camaraderie among shul goers and uh, people are in the room for a long time and whatever the case may be, there may be some, some problems that come about. So actually, um, this re someone reported, Ray Aaron Glatt, uh, reported on what's happened in some minyanim that have opened up in the past couple of weeks. Um, and he said some minyanim are, are conducted in accordance with protocol, but uh, he says he's shocked to hear of minyanim that, uh, that have uh, participants above the safe limit, you know, people above certain ages that are supposed to avoid davening in confined spaces, without good ventilation, and uh, there's, there's shalashudas, there's, there's eating happening in shul against all the, against all the rules. So another, another problem, uh, and someone came to a minion and, and was, got sick and wouldn't tell the other people. So the, one of the challenges is as soon as you open up, it's very hard to control people's, uh, people's uh, activities and people's, whether they're following the rules or not. So it's on, uh, there's a difference between theory and practice. So that, that's, the, that's the view, um, you know, that, that's the view and, and maybe some of the challenges to the view of having equal standards, saying that whenever the rest of the world opens up, the shul should open up in kind. Um, again, based on the idea of Shomer Pesayim Hashem, of saying regular normal activities should be assumed to be uh, halakhically permitted, even if they're not 100% safe. Um, although there, you know, there have been some, some challenges to that. And, but in, of, of course, any shul, let's say any shul in the New York area that has opened until this point um, is likely following those guidelines because um, when, when uh, Governor Cuomo, you know, said to open up shuls or open up religious institutions a week and a half ago, so institutions, shuls that opened up right after were saying, okay, the government says it's safe, we're going to open up, even though, of course, the, the government only did it under lobbying from various institutions. The government itself probably would have preferred that the shuls wait, but um, but once, uh, once the government allows it, there's no reason to be more stringent than the government. Let's open up our shuls, let's open up our institutions, as has happened in, in some places in the past week and a half, primarily in the, uh, at least in the New York area, primarily in the 
uh, the ultra-Orthodox or the Haredi world. However, there is another approach, which I think, um, you know, uh, we've sort of hinted at, but uh, another approach that says there's reason to be more concerned with pikuach nefesh, with more worried about danger than the rest of the population. So if, you know, if the government guidelines are for houses of worship to open on a certain date, to be more stringent than that. Or if the government says to open up beaches and restaurants and whatever else, to be more stringent than that view. And we'll see this view manifest itself as well in a few different ways. So um, one is back in March when, when uh, as we saw, the messaging of certain yeshivos was, we are closing, not because we're worried about the danger of coronavirus, but because the government forced us to close. So that was not, not just uh, uh, BMG, Beth Medish, Chicago, but other institutions had similar messaging, in the various uh, yeshivos across North America. And there was one, I, I thought at the time, was a very important voice speaking out against this, which is Rav Urin Reich, who has a small yeshiva in Lakewood, who just a few days after this spoke about this phenomenon. He said he closed his yeshiva. The government said, close it by Wednesday. And he said, I'm going to close it on Tuesday. So here's a quote from his lecture, from his uh, speech. Uh, it's in, in yeshivish a little bit. He says, Rabosai, I was taken aback, aback when people said to me, you close the yeshiva on Tuesday? The Mavshala only said to close it on Wednesday, right? The government said, wait till you, you only need to close it by Wednesday. Why are, you, why are you closing early? And he says, I'm not here to be Yotze the Memshala. That's a minimum. My goal is not to fulfill what the government guidelines are. No, I'm out to be Machmir, Kefia Efsher, in the midst of Pikuach Nefesh and Atzalas Nefashos. And I'm urging everybody else to do the same. The reason I closed is to, to save lives. And once the government said, you need to close by Wednesday, I realized this was actually very unsafe. And it's necessary to close now and be more stringent, as it were, than the government. And now also as a little bit of an apology of sorts. And if I didn't get it at the beginning, if I didn't, right, if I didn't realize soon enough, at, early enough to close, um, and you know, indeed he closed later than, than many other institutions, he said, let this be my kapara, let this be my atonement, and let, and let others uh, help, and let me help others understand the chomer asha and the chomas asha. Let me help others understand this, the, the urgency and the stringency and the obligation of the present time, which is to close down all institutions in order to protect lives. So I thought this was a very uh, early and very uh, morally clear voice saying that uh, just because, just because uh, it's permitted to be open legally doesn't mean that it's the right thing to do. If it's dangerous, then one has no right to remain open. So uh, moving to the reopening stage, the more, more the present, uh, closer to the present day. So the, the OU, the OU gave a, a set of guidance uh, starting back a couple weeks ago, three weeks ago, back on May 8th, guidance for opening, uh, reopening schools and communities coming out of the OU and the RCA. And just quickly run through this, um, but they, they make the argument that even though things are, look, numbers are looking better, things are getting better, the crisis is far from over. And, you know, these guidelines are, are to create a framework going forward as to how to Proceed and, and a various uh, prominent postkim or Schefter, or Willig, Rabbi uh, Kohn, or Rasher Weiss, various uh, major postkim in both the what you call the modern Orthodox and the Haredi world, um, you know, sort of signed on to these principles. So um, some of the principles are we're not yet ready to open, right? They need to they need to wait in order to preserve life, in order to focus on pikuach nefesh. And now this is a very important principle: the resumption of communal prayer and other communal activities should not be considered until, at the very least, the successful and verified safe completion of the local government's first stages of communal reopening, i.e. at least two weeks after the local governments have allowed public gatherings of more than 10 persons and not seen upticks in the disease. So that's why it says in New York, if the first phase of reopening is May 15th, the first stages of public davening would be May 29th. I think the New York in the end, uh, the first stage was May 20th or something to that effect. But the point is, the principle they're setting is, we are not going to rely on when, on when the state allows public gatherings. We're going to wait. We're going to take a wait and see attitude. We're going to wait two weeks because the assumption is that, that, that um, you know, there'll be some uptick, there'll be some increase in the disease if there is a real danger there. And we'll, before we open, we're going to make sure that other places uh, that, that try this out um, aren't, aren't uh, themselves facing problems. So it's, it's clearly more stringent. It's at least two weeks more stringent. And the logic is that um, we'll let everyone else be the trial phase if they want to. If they want to open institutions and, and people want to go outside and take that risk, they can. 
we don't feel comfortable taking that risk. We think that that still is problematic from a, from a Jewish uh, Torah halachic hashkafic perspective. We think this is against the Torah that, uh, or potentially uh, uh, this risk is too great to take given that we don't fully know what will happen. So wait and see, wait an extra two weeks and only then reopen. And the other principles, every community is different. The risks in different states are different. Um, it's a gradual process. You don't just reopen shuls. You slowly come back with, with, uh, with masks and with other uh, protection and, uh, and not for people who are at risk, uh, you know, who, are, who have uh, comorbidities and the like. It's important to have communal standards that are unified so there are no breakaway minyanim or some shuls open and not others um, and empathetic and firm communication, which is an important principle, right? Uh, you know, you can have the right uh, decision in theory, but not pass it down right. And reopening in controlled plan settings, which idea is that um, the shuls should control when Minyanim reopen instead of having people open uh, on their own, specific planning. Um, and the discussion of outdoor Minyanim, which are, are lower risk, but not, not no risk and shouldn't be a free for all. They go into a fair amount of, of, uh, of, of detail on this, but for our purposes, the most important, uh, the most important, and they also suggested, um, you know, laning should be done in a special way with, with only one person touching and taking out the Torah and, and not calling people up to the bima because that's dangerous. But, you know, without going into all those details, the, the core principle here for us is this idea that just because something is safe for the rest of the, of the population doesn't mean it's safe enough for, from a Torah perspective. It doesn't mean it's safe enough for shuls. And of course, this is not because the OU or RCA don't care about shul. They're obviously uh, very big, big fans of shul. That's sort of the business they're in. But the, to say that, that uh, Torah values would dictate that uh, one should avoid taking these risks until it's absolutely clear or until it's much more clear that this is safe and to have trial runs in the, in the population at large happen before shuls are willing to reopen. Now, this was complicated a bit by the fact that, um, that uh, Governor Cuomo and President Trump gave uh, the guidance to open up religious institutions earlier before all other institutions, although that got challenged on, on, uh, on uh, you know, uh, uh, on First Amendment uh, grounds and whatnot. But um, they, they re even after that statement was made, they reiterated their, their point of waiting at least 14 days, although the 14 days, instead of the 14 days being from some later expected point of when there'd be uh, general gatherings, the, the, those, you know, the, the starting point for that moved up because the, uh, you know, the government allowed for more uh, more meetings at an earlier date. Um, so that, that complicated things a bit, but essentially the, the basic idea of being more stringent than the government and having a trial period was still in place. Um, and again, just to give, give some of the, the logic for this, some of the basis for this, so Rav Usher Weiss, again, a, a Haredi, uh, or a, a Pesach in, in the Haredi world in Israel, has had this uh, shear where, an impassioned uh, shear where he talks about how important it is to follow the guidelines and maybe be, even be more stringent than them. And he had this very powerful line uh, translated from the Hebrew. It says, I think the health ministry is uh, over, overly lenient, uh, mekil gadol, and it's an ignoramus. He says it's uh, ama aretz, and we need to be more stringent than them. Just because the government allows something, you know, they may be taking risks that we're not willing to take uh, from a Torah perspective. And this was elaborated upon in, in great detail um, by Rav Meir Tversky. Um, who's a Rosh Yeshiva at YU, generally doesn't wade into public discourse or psak. He's, he's more, he doesn't usually take public stands, but on this issue, he says that, you know, this is a danger and, uh, you know, you really need to get this right. And that's why he, he said he was willing to go out on a limb and, uh, and take a strong stance on this issue, uh, on, on the issue of, of uh, being, of v'chai bahem, of protecting lives and that value in Judaism. So we're just going to quickly run through a couple of essays. One, a month and a half ago, and one just a week or so ago, that Rav Tversky offered, where he lays out his position. So he quotes the Rambam, uh, which we saw parallel, uh, paralleled in the Shulchan Aruch, that he says, uh, If someone is in danger, it's prohibited to delay in the violation of Shabbos, based on And he says, what do we learn from here? We learn that the laws of the Torah are not, uh, you know, vengeance or are not violent. Rather, they're merciful and loving and peaceful. That's what Torah is. Torah is not uh, about death. Torah is about life and affirming life and, and loving life. The Elu Api Karsin, these, uh, or Haminim, these, these people who reject the Torah, these uh, uh, false 
believers, Sheomrim Shezechil Shabbos, that they say it's a violation of Shabbos to save a life on Shabbos, the Usr Aleim, the Usr, and it's prohibited, Aleim Akasav Omer, Vegamani Nasatim, Chukim Lotov, Mishpatim, Yichibahem. Well, I, those people are given a false Torah. Those people are not following the real Torah, and their Torah is a Torah of death, and we'd reject that completely. And um, so the, the, and he quotes, he quotes, uh, first he quotes his, his grandfather, the rubber, right, Joseph B. Soloveitchik, um, uh, his elaboration on this, on this Rambam, in the line from the Shulchan we saw before, Anishal Harizim Megudav, Ashol Hariz, Ashol Pech you know, you shouldn't, you shouldn't be asking questions, you should be taking care of the dangers as quickly as possible. And he says, Ein divrei Torah, misnagdim The Torah is not opposed to the laws of nature and to normal life. And it doesn't conflict with the world. It affirms the world and it, uh, it affirms life rather than rejecting it. And so Rav Tversky makes the point, the, the theological point, that hamizalzel b'din pikuach nefesh. Eino rach mizalzel b'din echad prati If you reject this idea of saving a life, you think, no, you shouldn't, uh, you shouldn't be so quick to save lives. You're not just rejecting a detail of the Torah, which obviously one is doing, that's obviously a terrible thing. You're denying and you're misrepresenting the entire Torah because you're showing that you view the Torah not as racham and not as loving and not as life affirming, but as nikama, as, as vengeful, uh, as, as death seeking. And if that's your view of the Torah, you've, you've uh, undermined the entirety of the Torah, which is a horrible chil Hashem. And he says, he says many, many gedol, maybe great, many great Torah scholars made the right decision. But he also says, there were some, anansadi, shalok kulam higivuke, not all of them responded right. Some of the Torah leaders made a mistake. They, they, they missed on this point. And, um, and then he adds a point, they, they then compounded their mistake. Gam kasher na'anenu, lidrishos, levatel knufiasa, even when we, and he's sort of including himself in this group, even though he himself did not fall prey, but it's sort of, uh, he's saying when, when these rabbis were, uh, they followed, they ended up following the, the restrictions on having groups. They said, why are we doing this? For external reasons. The government's making us. We have no chance. Not because of a chai behem. And he says, This is a further ziyof hatar, further uh, uh, you know, uh, falsification of the Torah to say we're only closing because the government made us and not because of Fikuach Nefesh. And it's not right, well, one's misrepresenting the Torah. The, the idea that the Torah would say, would dictate that one remain open is a horrible, horrible statement to say about the Torah. This is horrific to see and to hear. And that's why it says, you know, we need to, we need to come to terms with this. We need to reorient ourselves and take the proper approach here. And he says at the end of this piece, or what we were reciting, we have a double obligation, to fix the past to the extent possible, to maybe, you know, uh, do tshuva or admit one's error, and to also to uh, message the truth of the Torah in the future, that the Torah believes in life and closing down to save lives. That was back in April. And just uh, about 10 days ago, uh, yet another essay where he discussed uh, about reopening now, and just the title, Lech Ami Babachad Arecha, Go My Nation, Enter Your Rooms, Bidvara Isra Lakayim Tfila Betzivar Rishari Knufiasa Ka'es B'Medina Senu. The prohibition to have public prayer or other gathering in our state, or maybe nation. Um, and we're not going to have time to go through this in detail, but he mentions that there's a whole discussion about whether to have Minyanim again, whether to have Minyanim Mir Peset, uh, 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 Porch Minyanim, which we discussed a few weeks ago, um, and maybe to open shuls and open yeshivas and maybe even open camps, which is not the same thing. And he says, These are all, should all be prohibited absolutely because of danger. And he goes into some detail. One of, the, one of the points he makes is that there's a difference between private person's danger and public danger. So what we saw about the, in the Rav Moshe, about smoking being allowed, because, it only it, because it's Shomer uh, P'sayim Hashem, it's a normal thing that you can rely on, that only applies to individuals. But if you're endangering someone else, that's a whole, a whole new level, and that we wouldn't apply that. So since, by definition, pandemics, uh, you know, you have a minion that spreads it, you're endangering not just the people in that minion, but everyone, because it, it, it spreads far and wide, that would be a reason to be stringent. And he adds, to the extent that people are relying on medical uh, information, even if you ask the doctors, they're not saying, they don't, the doctors don't yet have clarity. 
the details of, of this disease are changing at every, at every turn. Um, you know, you see, uh, should you want to wear masks or not, that changed. Um, how, far, how far apart? What are the risks of catching it from packages? The, the, the guidance on that changed. Are children fully safe or not? Or are there some secondary diseases children get that, that change? So there's a, lot, there's a lot of details that are coming out. It's not because the doctors aren't doing their job. They're doing what they can. But the, by definition, this is a new disease where the, details, where the details are changing. And he says, you can't rely, you can't rely on, on the government. The government's doing its best to balance various factors, to balance what information it has and economic necessity and need to open up. But it's, it doesn't have the same standards that the Torah does about pikuach nefesh. So there's two different, right? When you, when you make a decision as to whether, uh, whether to open up any institution, you're, you have to figure out a few things. What is the risk that the doctors say, although they don't have uh, foolproof information yet? You have the second factor of what, what uh, you know, how much do we value that risk? Meaning how, you know, let's say there's a risk, one in a thousand uh, people in, in the state will die. So how much, how bad is that? How does one weight that? against the other side, which is the value of reopening um, for whatever that institution is. So he says, the question, the doctors, we, we trust doctors generally, but we have to keep in mind that they themselves aren't certain. They don't have all the information yet. In terms of how to value the danger, the government has no say. The government can, can make its own decision on how to value danger. And we certainly, if the government says to close, you know, uh, one can't open if the government says to close, but if the government thinks it's worth opening, the Torah may very well think that danger is more stringent. And, uh, and we need to be, or that we, it values the danger, uh, you know, more highly. And we need to, therefore, take extra precautions. So he, he makes uh, those various points. And he says, he also throws in, some people may have thought that, well, you know, uh, some people think, well, shul is an essential service. So the question isn't whether to open shul, but how to open shul. And it has to happen anyways. The question is to find the best way to do it. And he says, you know, this, this is based on error because if there is a danger, it's, it's not imperative to open shul if it's dangerous. If it's dangerous, one doesn't open the shul. And people giving their quote-unquote medical opinion on something that's essentially a values issue, once you evaluate the danger, you need to talk about the Torah's values and how to balance danger against opportunity, that those people make many mistakes as well. Um, towards the end, uh, he, he notes that uh, some have, have suggested that what do you do? Meaning, and this goes back to the point before, we all take risks. We all drive on highways. Um, another example, um, you know, people, uh, if, uh, if a woman uh, has a, gets pregnant and has a child, there's not an insignificant risk to her. And we don't say, okay, well, we, you know, there's a risk, there's a slight risk. We shouldn't drive on highways. We shouldn't, uh, you know, women shouldn't bear children. That's not, that's not the way we function. So how does that work? And he says, there's this idea of if something is normal, the idea of Shomer Psaim, something is normal, it, it can be done and we don't apply the risk. So why doesn't that apply here? So he, he writes, um, let's see, um, here. Ms. ben Nachon hu, sheyesh lahavchin bein sakana overes, vein sakana shen ishtarsha v'yatser metzios chadasha, new normal. So there is a difference between a, a passing danger, there's a danger right now, and if we just shut down for a week, we can avoid this danger, versus a new normal, meaning like something like the flu. There's always, you know, for every year, there's a certain risk of the flu. There's a difference between something that becomes normal and something passing. Um, and he says, uh, if something is a passing danger, one can be more lenient with it. Uh, one can be more stringent. One must be more stringent. Whereas something that's become a part of reality, you can't live your life if you would always shut down. And his point on, on this is that, uh, is that since we don't yet know enough about coronavirus, we don't know the proper treatments, we don't have a vaccine, we don't yet know exactly how it works and what, what exactly the dangers are and for who, we should wait until that clarifies itself before we should take further action. And for that reason, he's opposed to opening, uh, to opening all shuls. Again, taking this idea of, of being more stringent than the government, maybe to its logical extreme, right? Not just waiting a couple of weeks, like the OURCA and wait and see, but to say that until we really have a better sense of how this works, um, there's enough of a risk that we shouldn't be, we shouldn't be opening for the foreseeable future. Um, one, yeah. So he, right, he, he has, in a, a shir he gave, a lecture he gave, uh, that I transcribed, he has a great mushal, a great parable for this, uh, to give guidelines now for how to deal with this danger, which is now embedded in our lives, is like putting someone behind the car without him having the foggiest notion of if it's safe to drive at 20 miles per hour or 40 or 80 or 200 miles an hour, whether they should drive with their eyes open 
or their eyes closed. That's, we, don't, we just lack the information to know how to navigate this properly. And that's why he says to wait and uh, find. One other, uh, even more recently, just uh, May 24th, Rabbi Daniel Friedman, uh, a friend of mine and uh, a rabbi at the Jewish Center of Teaneck, also offered uh, a set of policy guidelines. I'm just going to quickly summarize that for reasons of time, um, where he makes the argument that just because the government allows something, it doesn't mean that it's halakhically permitted. Of course, this is true, right? A government allows you to eat certain foods. Government allows you to eat pork, but halacha doesn't. So it should be the same thing here. The government allows you to open businesses and institutions, but that doesn't mean that it's permitted according to, uh, according to Judaism. And there may be different interests. The government maybe just want to flatten the curve to make sure there's not too much of a spike. Whereas halacha values human life uh, in itself uh, to, to a great extent. Um, one very interesting and creative point that he makes is that what's the value of davening publicly? Prayer, tefillah b'tzibra, prayer and shul. The value is, there's a couple different formulations, but people, by doing it together, that God is more present in a sense. And it's like a, it's a Kiddush Hashem. It's a sanctification of God's name to have a group of Jews praying together uh, in, in a minion, let's say, with the with Rav Shavikdusha. So he makes the argument that right now, we shouldn't feel like our religiosity is lacking. Right now, if we're staying at home and doing whatever we're doing and not going into public and endangering people, we should feel that what we're doing is we are protecting the rest of the world. We are doing the very important mitzvah of pikuach nefesh. We're saving lives by staying home. And that itself is a kiddush Hashem. That's a sanctification of God's name by sanctif sanctifying the values of Judaism and human life. And to say that we should go to shul, which, which entails a risk and certainly is not op obligatory now because it's, because it's dangerous and may not even be preferable because you're, you know, you're, you're taking on risks. We don't really know the exact extent of the risk. And if you stay home and you're protecting your neighbors and protecting everyone by not going into public, that itself is a Kiddush Hashem of sorts. Um, so to just look at the line here, um, uh, while it's true that praying with a quorum, with a minion, enables reciting Dvarim Shavik Dusha, it's e and that's a sanctification of the divine name, a Kiddush Hashem, it's equally true that one who's involved in the Torah-level sanctification of God's name, associated with protecting his life and that of others, by refraining from unnecessary entry into communal settings in a pandemic is at the absolute minimum doing at least as much to sanctify the name of the Almighty. And maybe he's doing much more, but at least as much. On that basis, uh, Rabbi Fridman says to wait not just two weeks, but to wait a, a total of four weeks before having Minion. It goes into more details. What, what uh, you know, I, I think what, what these last two views show, Rabbi Tversky and Rabbi Fridman, to different degrees, is sort of the opposite extreme, that one can take the idea of pikuach nefesh, of saving a life, such uh, to to such a uh, you know to such an extent that one would go you know not just two weeks but four weeks maybe even more than that without having minion because of of the the risk of uh, to human life and and instead valuing the saving of human life so again just to quickly give that framework again there seem to be three different views out there one should be more lenient uh, in terms of pikuach nefesh than the rest of the population maybe because of the value of Torah study which may protect or maybe some other reason or maybe that's all based on faulty medical information, but at least that view is out there. A second attitude to treat this, treat things equally to the government, if the government says, or to, to the rest of the population, if it's okay for people to go to the beach, it should be okay for people to go to shul. And then a final view, which I think is, is very prevalent, certainly in the, uh, in the modern Orthodox world, the OU and RCA guidance, that one should be more concerned with the dangers uh, than the rest of the population. Even though the government opens up, you should wait at least, wait and see, see if there are actually dangers associated with that, maybe even wait until one has clear medical knowledge um, or, or, uh, and to, to understand that there's great value in staying home. And just one final thought, there's a question here of the, uh, you know, of the form of fulfilling the Torah versus the idea of, you know, of, uh, of one's commitment to following Torah. Because usually what it means to, uh, you know, for many, many people, what it means to be an observant Jew means, or certainly an observant male Jew, means to go to Minyan regularly. Um, and to say that we can't do that now makes some people feel like I'm missing out on my Jewish practice. And what the, what the response is among some, including Rabbi Friedman that we just saw, is no, you, you may be missing out on the form of your usual form of Jewish practice, but you are fully, uh, you are fully engaged in a, uh, a great religious activity of saving lives and sanctifying God's name as a result. Um, so we should all hopefully 
uh, not have to ask these questions anymore. We should soon be in a place where everyone agrees it's safe to uh, have minyanim, but for the time being, these are the views that are out there on, uh, on how to balance saving one's life with uh, saving, saving human lives with other, uh, other religious values. Um, I see that there's a chat, just a second, let me stop share. How do you apply this to opening up the economy? Okay, so a great, great question. And this is actually something that's been avoided in most of these treatments. Uh, Rabbi Tversky in one of his articles sort of mentions in passing that opening, that uh, going to work might be an exception. So there, there's, there's a bit of a complicating factor here, right? Because um, davening in public, da, public, public prayer, public tefillah, may, you know, someone, uh, the question was whether that's Durabanan or not. There's a question how exactly you count that. Um, is it Durabanan, but maybe the Qiyam is Duraisa? Leaving that question aside, there is an argument to be made that, um, that going to work, one might be more willing to undertake certain risks in going to work that one wouldn't be willing to take in going to shul. For the reason that if people don't go to work, they won't, you know, they won't be able to eat, they won't be able to, to uh, sustain themselves. Uh, and certainly if that's the case, um, you know, the, the, there's, there's more room to take on certain risks. Whereas davening, as, as we saw, it's certainly possible to pray at home and it's possible to even uh, fulfill various, uh, various uh, wonderful things like Kiddush Hashem, sanctifying God's name, Pikuach Nefesh, at home as well. Um, so, so, I mean, Roy Tversky doesn't explicitly say this, but he says it's absolutely prohibited to have a minion inside, outside, right now. And he says in terms of going to work, that's a separate question. So presumably he would allow in some cases for that, if it really was something that was necessary for someone's, uh, you know, uh, someone to be able to to uh, subsist, certainly, and I don't know exactly where one would draw the line, but yes, it, there is more leeway for that uh, in, in, in Rostorsky's view, certainly, than for having Minion. Are there other questions? I'm just posted right now. What about Yom Kippur? Yom Kippur, wow. Um, well, we're not, yet, we're not yet there. I haven't seen many people talking about that in orthodoxy. I know, I know there was some, a couple of, a few weeks ago, there was some discussion um, in, uh, you know, outside of orthodoxy, what to do. And there was even a tshuva out of the conservative movement. Um, yeah, it's a great question. I don't know. Uh, it's hard to, it's hard to guess. I mean, I think in principle, the same arguments apply, right? There's no principle difference between Yom Kippur and any other day. Obviously, in terms of religious experience, people's Yom Kippur experience is, uh, is very much enhanced uh, in shul as opposed to not in, in a variety of ways, or at least can be enhanced. Um, but I think, you know, I don't know, it may, it may shift the, uh, the, arg the argumentation a bit here or there, but I think the basic principles are consistent or are, would be the same. We have one more actually from Facebook. Okay. Uh, Joe Blank says, for those who value Torah over Pikuach Nefesh, how do they address the deaths from the virus and from communities? Yeah, it, it's, it's a great question. I mean, some of those views were, um, were stated in March, you know, where, where, uh, you know, sadly, people didn't yet know the extent and, and the risks, um, but some of those views are even being stated today or, you know, a couple weeks ago. Uh, um, I think some of it is just saying, well, these were all old people anyway, and, you know, it's overstated, and, uh, you know, it's not really as bad as you think. There's some playing down of the facts. Um, you know, it's mostly people in old age homes, but yeah, it, it's, it's really tough to understand it. I mean, I think if you have the numbers staring you in the face, to say that there's not really a danger, that the danger is, that's a risk worth taking, very hard to, to justify. And yet there are people out there doing it. Um, you know, I think, uh, I think the, the, the other, you know, the, that's an extreme and I don't think that's representative, certainly now, I don't think that's representative of any major portion of, of uh, the, you know, of leadership, of uh, rabbinic leadership in the Jewish community. But uh, there are some people out there saying, I don't know, I don't know quite how to justify it. Thank you. All right. Thank you all. I hope to see you all here next week. Same time, same place. And uh, if you have any questions, you can email inquiry at drisha.org and we'll pass your question along to Rabbi Zakir. Have a wonderful week, everyone.